Kia ora koutou. Lovely to see you today. Now, some people are away and they've given us their apologies. And of course, other people are watching the concert, I'm sure, on television. It was very tempting this morning, wasn't it, with the TV on and the warmth in the house to thank God. And I remember I had to come to church because I was doing something. And um, I had the jacket already for the concert, you see. Robin said to me yesterday, I'm going to wear gold. And I thought, well, so am I. And I thought, gosh, I hope I don't get upstaged. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, so happy to be welcoming Sylvia into our group this morning. And uh, Sylvia is here to lead the celebration of communion. Uh, but also she's here to worship with us and to be our friend and guide today. She's going to preach. Sylvia's been part of the Presbyterian Church in Greenfield for a little while now. For over 50 years, she told me. And her late husband was an elder and session clerk, and she became an elder a few years after he died. Sylvia is authorised by Presbytery to conduct communion. She has many, many interdenominational connections and has preached in different churches, partly because of her work with the Scripture Union of New Zealand. She was regional director for quite some time, 12, 13 years, something like that, and is now in a smaller part-time role. In 1997, she had five minutes spare, so started theological study, and it led to an MA in theology and ongoing reading and exploration. Sylvia is very interested in other faiths, and that might be something for us to talk to her about. Her university studies were in English and history, and she used to teach alongside Nan Ensign at Westlake Girls, and here is a direct quotation from Sylvia. I taught alongside Nan Ensign at Westlake Girls, where she was a most lovely dean for my daughter. And that does not surprise us. So welcome everybody. The candles are lit to symbolise the presence of Christ, and the small candle, the votive candle, has been lit for peace in our midst. This is the day, of course, when we celebrate the Pentecost the gift of the Holy Spirit. May those two candles connect with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to say the greeting together as we normally do. All together. I am I. I am I. One young. Fakalo fela niyatu. Afi o mai. Lulu tanu mai. Talo falaba. Sun ying. Salamata tam. Vitche. Ula, welcome, welcome. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. Alleluia. The wind of God is blowing. Sing praises. Sing, Sing praises to God. Now is the time to dance heaven's dance. Time to discern eternity's face. It's a moment of knowing beyond all sight. A day of God's smile and tender embrace. Anyone you would like to mention today, just as we begin our service? Robin, is there any young person in your family you would like to mention? <laughs> Can I have a great grandmother. Great grandmother! Yeah. Um, to Max. Max Hamilton Shields. Max Hamilton Shields. Well, there's a name to conjure with. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You're too young, great yes. great grandmother. <laughs> Fiona's oh. birthday. Fiona, I've got a gift for you, which is a bag of jackets in my office. That, so, you know, that is my very special gift. Can we do a happy birthday earlier? Uh, anybody else? Happy birthday to Fiona then. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lord. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lord. Happy birthday to you. Hooray! Hooray! Fantastic. And I've got a part for you in a little while in the service. Couldn't you get it? There we go. 
So we gather grateful for the companionship of hearts and minds, seeking to speak the truth in love. We gather grateful for our heritage, for the women and men before us whose prophetic words and deeds make possible our dreams and our insight. And we gather grateful for the gift of life itself, mindful that to respect life means both to celebrate what life is and to insist on what it can become. Our friends, the presence of God is surely in this place. The presence of God is everywhere. And so now we open our hearts to receive the presence of God in this place at this time. We seek praise to express the presence of God in all places at all times. And so we are gathered here to remind ourselves and each other that God is everywhere at all times. God is in all people, in all things, in all places, and in all circumstances. To see God when we expect to find God, we open our eyes. To see God everywhere, we must open our hearts. And so let us pray. Activating God, speaking at all times, in the quiet and in the drama of life, inflame us with the desire and confidence to hear your call and follow your lead. God of many dimensions, help us to recognise the gifts and promise of diversity, to embrace the newness that is growth and the sacredness in all. God, you are our truth teller, sifter of human hearts, strainer of human motives. And together, God, God, we build our towers to be known and recognised, to gather ourselves our human achievements. God, we reveal in our love for the law of similar, the comfort we find in the familiar, the cultures and people we know. God, see again our struggles for the difference, our rigidity in the face of diversity. We pause in confession, making space for the spirit of truth, sifter of human hearts, strainer of human motives. And so let us pause as we think over these words. And we hear your words of forgiveness. Peace I leave with you. God's peace is given to us. In you, God, our hearts are no longer troubled. And for this we gratefully say, Amen. Amen. Celebrations! So, now Fiona. <laughs> Just pop my mask on. Yeah. <laughs> would, you like to, would you like to sort of come up here or pay? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right to take one of these and say, Oh, come and join Fiona. Come on. Would you, Juliet and Spencer, would you like to come up with Fiona? It's her birthday. And she's just about to do something. You've just arrived at the right time. Come on. Here we are. Would you like to take one of these? You know what to do with these? Because it's Fiona's birthday. Here's Fiona. Look. It's your birthday. And so today we are kind of thinking of a birthday. We're thinking of the birthday of the church. Pentecost is often called the birthday of the church. And the big gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, you know, uh, adults get caught up in structures about things. Perhaps we think too much sometimes and don't have enough feeling about where we are. I was giving this some thought as I ponder Matariki, as we move into Matariki this month, that New Year period in um, Polynesia and here in Aotearoa. 
And do you remember how recently we sang that we were standing on holy ground? Do you remember singing that the other week? <laughs> and in, Ma in the Maori world, the earth is uh, is the earth mother. And the earth mother is about relationship. It's not about standing on the ground. It's about being in relationship with the ground. And last night, I was watching, the, we were both watching the documentary, uh, the, the Unseen Queen, narrated by the Queen. Who watched that documentary? Did you see that? Well, you see that? It was very moving, wasn't it? And it wasn't the big message about essentially how important ordinary life is. Did you feel that? Ordinary life and connections and relationship. And the Queen spoke about not being able to address the big evils of the world, except through the concerted effort of doing good things. And it, as everybody says, you talk to her faith, you know, that faith came through, through very strongly, I think, in that documentary. One of the um, talks that we heard in, in Winchester Cathedral, we watched online, the preacher talked about the Queen's amazing ability just to be present and to listen. And that when she speaks, she speaks with very few words. They're short speeches, but they're quite impactful. And insofar as I've ever been able to watch the Queen's Christmas message, because it seems everybody in the house, if not the neighbourhood, is conspiring to get in the way of my watching it on Christmas Day, um, I have always found that to be so. So today we're thinking about celebrating and we're thinking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, uh, I'm thinking about the Queen's faith, you know, and C.S. Lewis wrote that book called Mere Christianity, Simple Christianity, Straightforward Faith, and the Queen, the Queen is a, a, bit like, a, a bit like that, I think. I've been thinking of that. So let's pray, friends. Loving God, we are thankful for the service of the Queen. Not everybody agrees with the institution of the monarchy, but perhaps most of us can see in this 96-year-old person somebody who made an oath of presence and service and who is taking that into the late years of her life with dedication and commitment. We ask a blessing on the children in church today. We're glad to be able to celebrate age at either end of the spectrum and at every point in between. So we're grateful for the sharing and the connection. For having young people here, for having older people here. Because together we all receive the gift that is the gift of life and the gift of spirit. And so God, we say thank you. Amen. You might know this song. Thank you. <laughs> hey, the gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen, God save Noise. A large crowd gathered. They were all excited. 
because each one of them heard the believers speaking in her, this or her own, her own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, These people are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? From Parthia, Media, and Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus in Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, and from Egypt, and the regions of Libya near the Cyrene. Some of us are from Rome, both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism, and some of us are from Crete in Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, These people are drunk. Then Peter, Peter stood up with the other eleven apostles, and in a loud voice began to speak to the crowd, Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. To this, this is what I will do in the last days, God says. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my own servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on them in those days, and they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above, and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood, fire, and thick smoke, and the sun will be darkened, and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then, whoever calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. The next reading is from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17. Yes, 15 to 17. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. He will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him, because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him, because he remains with you, and is in you. And then from verse 25, I have told you this, while I am with you. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember all that I have told you. Peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> Thank you very much for your welcome. It's a privilege for me to be here. In the past, I've spoken in both St. Aidan's and St. Andrew's, um, and I can see some familiar faces. And I've spoken with some reference to my work with Scripture Union, and I'm not here today to talk about Scripture Union, but because of that connection, I put some giveaway things on the table in the hall um, that I that set up there. So you're welcome to take away any of the things that are there. Now, most of you are not the right age for our youth camps, but we do have quite a lot of youth camps, and the brochure that I'd hope to have here wasn't available. There's one of these fancy ones with those little funny little signs on them and it just gives you an idea of the range of the sort of work that Scott Union is doing with um, young people. And you do something or other and I've never actually done this. <laughs> Photographed it and it opens up what it's all about. So you can pick up any of those things. Um, I've also got there some um, Bible reading guides, um, which we actually sell, but these ones are out of date ones and you're welcome to take them away if you'd like to. 
Now, perhaps some of you grew up in the same kind of family as I did. A family in which parents, grandparents, and most aunties and uncles began each day reading from the Bible and praying. And by the time I was about 14 or 15, that was my usual practice too. And it didn't seem like a chore or something I had to do. It's still nearly always how the day begins for me. I come to the Bible with what you could call a hermeneutic of trust. A sense that even though this is an old collection of writings, and we don't know who all the authors were, yet it still claims to be words from God as well as from human authors. And it certainly can speak to us in interesting and relevant ways. Not in a simplistic way, of course, and not without recognising the different kinds of writing in the scripture. But what are we to make of Acts chapter 2? The scene is dramatic and quite puzzling. There are about 120 people together, including the mother and brothers of Jesus. They've been praying and waiting for something that Jesus talked about before he went back to heaven 10 days before. Suddenly, there's this huge, loud wind filling the whole house. And it looks as though they've each got a tongue of fire on their heads. And they start speaking in languages they've never learned. It is very noisy. They spill out onto the street. And people who've come from all different places around the Mediterranean and even further afield can hardly believe it because they hear these people speaking in their languages from back home. Languages they hadn't expected to hear while they were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And then Peter, the fisherman, who'd been so timid and scared only seven weeks earlier at the time of the Passover, He's up on his soapbox speaking to the crowd. No microphone, of course, not of either sort. <laughs> I don't know how they did it, actually. Um, anyway, he's probably speaking in um, Aramaic or maybe in Greek because those would have been quite widely known. Peter is saying that what they are seeing and hearing is a fulfillment of what Joel had said 400 or 500 years earlier. Now, that was quite a long reading, Gary, but that wasn't the end of what he said. He went on by speaking about Jesus, accusing his hearers, the audience, of being complicit in his death, declaring that God had raised Jesus to life again, that he was now exalted at the right hand of God and had just poured out the Holy Spirit on his believers. When the people in distress ask what to do, Peter says, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the Holy Spirit. The passage goes on to say that on that day, 3,000 people were baptised and added to the group of believers, and it continued to grow for the coming days. This was certainly a great beginning for the church. And it happened amongst people who already believed in God. They were Jews, or they were converts to um, the Jewish faith, I think, pretty well with them. You know, these days, especially in Western society, many people find it hard to believe in God and probably even harder to believe in the resurrection. Over 20 years ago, I was in a packed-out auditorium to hear the Reverend Dr. Tom Wright. Some of you have heard of him. He's a highly respected Anglican theologian and church leader from the UK. He's written lots of books. N.T. Wright, 
for his scholarly books and Tom Wright for his simpler ones. And he's got a lovely series called The Bible for Everyone or The John for Everyone or First Corinthians or that sort of thing. At the end of the evening, someone asked this question. Dr. Wright, do you believe that Jesus really did come back to life again? He replied, ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus did not come to life again, I have no way of explaining the Christian church. I think it's a very good answer. I also think that the huge challenge in Peter and the other disciples who slunk away in fear at the time of the crucifixion and who went on to suffer and most of them die for their faith is another evidence not only of the resurrection of Jesus, but of course of the reality of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost in Acts 2 was by no means the first appearance of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. In fact, we can go right back to the very beginning of the First Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. There was the Spirit of God hovering over the world that God is creating. In another translation, it says, a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Wind and Spirit are the same words in Hebrew. The word ruach. And what do we have at the beginning of Acts 2? A sound like the rush of a violent wind as the Spirit of God comes on the people. And then through that first testament, there are times when the Spirit comes upon this person or that person, empowering them in a special way. And then there's the prophets, prophets like Joel and Ezekiel and others, calling Israel to repent and often in various ways declaring that God's purposes are bigger than just one nation. Perhaps most entertainingly, I think, in the book of Jonah, which I tend to think of as a burlesque or a satire with our most profound message. It's just by the way. When we come to the New Testament, Luke's Gospel is the one that most frequently refers to the Holy Spirit, especially in the birth stories of Jesus. And the same author is generally accepted to have written Luke. So the Gospel ended with the resurrected Christ explaining from the Hebrew Scriptures why the Messiah had to die and telling them that repentance and forgiveness of sins was to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. He reminds them that they have been witnesses of what has happened, and he tells them to remain in the city until they were clothed with power from on high. They see him ascend to heaven, and they go back to Jerusalem with joy. Then at that's the end of the book. Acts chapter 1 picks up the story with a bit more detail about the ascension and goes on to describe the group meeting, waiting, and praying. And then we come to Acts 2 and those events which still are quite difficult to put together in, in many ways, but they're there. Our second reading was from John's Gospel which was probably written towards the end of the first century, maybe by the Apostle John, or maybe one of his disciples. It does seem to include eyewitness accounts. In Acts 2, it was many followers of the Jewish faith turning to Jesus. But by the time John wrote, the church had spread also to the Gentiles and to many parts of the Roman Empire and maybe beyond. 
I imagined him as an old man recalling what Jesus had said about the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom God would send to be with them, to be with them always, to teach them what Jesus had said. But what does the coming of the Holy Spirit mean for us in the here and now? Spirit is part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Spirit is given to Christians to help us become more like Jesus. But the Spirit doesn't force us. We choose how much we're prepared to listen and be guided by the prompting of the Spirit. And then in Paul's letter to the Galatians, and in a whole lot of the letters there's lots about the Holy Spirit, but in Paul's letter he lists the fruit of the Spirit, and you probably know what they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Of course, these good qualities are not exclusive to Christians. And we probably all know where we are lacking. But we can ask the Spirit to help us grow these gifts. Paul also adds in Galatians, if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The Spirit's prompting can be very gentle, and it's easy to miss it. One of my prayers is to be more sensitive, more alert, more attuned to the prompting of the Spirit. Paul even says that it's the Spirit that allows us to call God Father, Abba, Father, Dear Father, or Daddy. That is a tremendous thing. I'm not sure if there are any other faiths in which people talk to God as to a loving Father. Certainly our Muslim friends don't have that idea about God. In the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament or First Testament, I don't think, I can't remember, any prayers that address God as Father, although the idea is implied in some passages. It's Jesus who introduced that when he gave us the Lord's Prayer. Much more could be said about the gifts of the Spirit, the role of the Spirit in helping us to pray and even interceding for us. But I want to finish this reflection by encouraging us all to take time to allow the Spirit to speak to us. Not just on Sundays, that's one time when we do it, and, then, and together, but every day, and even on our own. May it be so for each one of us. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I'm to sing again, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. I acknowledge this prayer prepared by the Reverend Dr. Steve Taylor. It's from the weekly worship program of the Church of Scotland. There is a response to the line. After I say, with God's Spirit we pray, our response should be, only love can conquer hate. Let us pray. When we look at our world, we see war and conflict, hatred between people of different languages. With God's Spirit we pray, only love can, can conquer hate. When we look at our country, we see egos and deals, building projects and business towers. With God's Spirit we pray, only love can conquer hate. When we look at our church, we see tribalisms and insecurity, denominations that seem fractured. With God's Spirit we pray, only love can conquer hate. 
when we look at ourselves, we see suspicion of others, mistrust and indifference towards those not like us. With God's Spirit we pray, only love can conquer hate. And so, empowered and renewed by your Spirit, we pray for your Church around the world. Amen. When we um, celebrate communion, we remember the last meal that Jesus had before the crucifixion. Paul wrote about it in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, and then a bit later, Mark wrote his version, and then Matthew and Luke also. There are a few differences in the words that um, Jesus said but they all agreed on his actions. I have to do this with one hand. <laughs> he took the bread. He blessed it. I'm just going to come and be the microphone stand. <laughs> he broke it. He broke it and he gave it. So those four things are in all of those accounts. Taking the bread, blessing it, praying, breaking it, and then giving it. He took the wine and he blessed it. He poured it, do I pour it in here? And then it was distributed, he gave it to the disciples. A few, uh, a few hours later, Jesus was dead. His followers were devastated. They couldn't understand what was going on. But on the third day, his body was gone. It was said that he'd come back to life, but where was he? That day, two people walked sadly home to Emmaus. A stranger came along. They looked so sad, he asked them what they were talking about. They told him about the prophet Jesus, who did wonderful things, and they had such high hopes that he was going to deliver their country from their enemies. But then the chief priest had handed him over and he'd been crucified. And that morning, some women went to his tomb and it was open and his body was gone. They said they'd seen the vision of angels who told them Jesus was alive, but no one seemed to have seen him. It was very puzzling. Then the stranger started talking, quoting the prophets and praying explaining things about the Messiah. It was interesting to listen to. When they got to their home, please come in, eat with us, they said. He came, he sat down at the table, and then he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. Ah, it was Jesus, he was alive. He disappeared and they dashed back to Jerusalem to tell the others. But the same actions were very, very memorable. Interestingly, it's the same actions even when he feeds the 5,000 um, and the 4,000. The same sort of actions, and actions are so important and stand out in our memory a long time. In two of the accounts of the Last Supper, Jesus said, Do this in memory of me. And that's what we're going to do in a moment. As we take the bread that represents his body, let's also remember that the church is described as the body of Christ. We'll take the communion wine that represents his blood 
of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's not do it like you. Remember, Jesus had said, I am the bread of life. I took on human life. I offered it up to God. I'm going to be broken on the cross and given for you. And Jesus says, do this in memory of me. Recognize that our lives are a gift from God. Offer them up to God. Be willing to lose ourselves in his service and to be given for others. Please put the stewards come forward now. Um, they'll distribute the little cups and I invite you to wait until after I've prayed and blessed the elements and then we'll all partake of it together. back to God. Our Father, in your name, we bless these elements which represent for us the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. We confess our failings and we thank you for all that our salvation means to us. We also know that you have called us to be the body of Christ in this world. Help us to be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit and to know the power of the Spirit as we seek to serve you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's all eat and drink together. So friends, might as well stay standing just for these few words. <laughs> Today we have celebrated the spirit active in our world. We've acknowledged the sometimes dramatic, often gentle presence we name God. Wherever we are, there is God. In all the places believers are not, there is God also. In all the things we celebrate and in everything that troubles us, there is God. In the crowd of places and the deserts, there is God. There is, there is nowhere, no, no circumstance without God. May awareness, May awareness of God's, God's Spirit enlighten us in faith and compassion. compassion. 